It's Friday, August the 30th, 2024, and this is How to Restart a Church, a spinoff podcast where I, Pastor Trey Comstock, and my friend and colleague, uh, Pastor Emily Larson, and often, as you're about to find out and can see on camera if you are uh, watching the video version of this, hear from cool people uh, to learn about how to make church happen and how to make church happen again. This week, we are joined by the Reverend Dr. Elaine Heath. Uh, we talked about about her pharmacy um, a few weeks back. And so now we have the joy of uh, being joined by her uh, to hear from her about uh, what is what is this thing, this amazing thing, um, and how did this amazing thing uh, come to be? And so thank you uh, for joining us, Elaine. We are so excited. And so I, as, as I said, like, well, you, we attempted to describe um, what, what, what this what is. What is a pharmacy? Yeah. <laughs> what is a pharmacy? Um, how would you describe your pharmacy? Well, thanks for having me on your podcast. I really am honored. And I think this is going to be a fun conversation. And I love what you're doing in ministry where you are too. So a pharmacy, this is our homemade word. A pharmacy is the <laughs> geographic hub of our new monastic missional community, which is United Methodist, and it's super ecumenical. So we're a project of the North Carolina Conference, as far as the, the appointment, I'm the appointed elder here and so on. And so we have 23 acres of farm and forest. Um, the, the majority of the land is forest, and then about five acres is under agricultural production. And um, the forest and the field uh, is very beautiful with old, old 150-year-old um, trees and walking trails and places to stop and meditate. Um, we're getting ready to put in sort of a stations of creation um, instead of stations of the cross. It'll be oh, nice. um, very much grounded in Celtic and Franciscan spirituality. Wow. Yeah. And um, there are six dwelling units on our property. Um, there is the, there, there are two houses that are roomy and have guest rooms um, where some of us live. And we also have guest rooms in our home and, and then in our homes. And then there are some tiny houses. And um, we have the latest addition to our community is a, a Duke Divinity student who was our intern last year. And this year he's living in a safari tent on a camping deck in oh, the woods. Geez. And uh, nice. getting ready to put a wood burning stove. He doesn't need it yet. It's still uh, yeah. hot. But <laughs> I was about to say, like you know, I, um, we in Houston we don't have seasons. It is just it's always ninety degrees. It can be ninety degrees in December. Yes. Uh, having lived, uh, in, you know, in Virginia and Georgia, that your part of the world has seasons. We do. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad he is. Uh, the, he's preparing for winter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, so Joe is a divinity student. We ha always have several divinity students um, as interns here uh, to learn new paradigms for ministry and to be grounded in the rhythms of life that we practice here as a new monastic community. So, um, yeah, so there are now, well, by the middle of September, there will be 13 people altogether living, living here at Spring Forest in these different places. And... The farm is, is the, the f most fundamental reason for farming and having the farm activities and growing the food and sharing the food is to develop circles of community, especially circles of community that heal the land, that heal living things that are not human, that heal human trauma, that heal uh, especially religious trauma, but other kinds of trauma. We do support refugee resettlement. We have a whole set of programming that we do to support refugee resettlement in this area. Most of the folks we're working with are from Afghanistan and sort of around that area of the world, although a few folks are from other parts of the world. And um, we partner with lots of different churches. We have an alternative funding strategy for our ministry, which I think you'll probably want to hear about that. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So I'll get into that in a little while. Um, but 
we're we're so farm is dairy farm is we we are literally uh, grounded in a on a piece of property that includes a farm and a forest and um the stary part <laughs> is about monastery and the new monasticism is different from the old monasticism in a number of different ways um uh, one of the ways is that it, that we're we're multi-generational, we're single and married, we're across a spectrum of sexual orientation, we're um, even, we're theologically diverse in uh, where we are, but we're able to hold this together with community pretty well. I mean, we, we have our drama once in a while, but, sure. um, like anybody does, but um, because mm -hmm. we're, we're a practice-based community, so we're not doctrinally uh, centered, we're practice-based and we're, we attempt to be trinered, centered around the Trinity. Um, so our, our rule of life is our set of practices, and that is prayer, work, table, neighbor, and rest. And we have a, a whole range of ways that we hold ourselves accountable and structure our lives so that that rule of life can become a supportive trellis for how we live together, for how we work yeah. together and serve our neighbors, and um, how we resolve conflict and all sorts of things. So that's probably a good place to pause. Yeah, that's all. I mean, that's, that's, beautiful. that's all a lot. Um, and so I, I, I said this in the pre-show, and I don't mind saying it on air, right? Like when we hear about these amazing projects that are doing so many amazing and innovative things, it can feel really intimidating of oh. like, as uh, certainly um, on us, you know, certainly as we think about the future of English ministry in the East End of Houston, like we are starting. And so I, I would love to know, the the cliff notes version of, of how does this this pharmacy come to be like where did it start and what was the process to grow into and and i suspect it's as especially as a farm it's a somewhat organic process but how does it grow <laughs> into who y'all are today yeah it's uh it's definitely an organic farm <laughs> we're, we're a regenerative <laughs> farm too because we have very deep commitments to caring for the earth and, and yeah. for the divine uh, being expressed to us in and through all the created thing, all the living things. So um, probably the, the, the first place it begins is when I'm a, a little girl growing up in a violent family. And one of the places I find solace and joy is at a neighbor's farm where yeah. I fall in love with the chickens. <laughs> I fall in love with the chickens. Yeah. Um, yeah. Their house was always a mess. There were a lot of flies. I mean, it was it was a questionable sanitary situation, but but I I found love there, and 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 I remember resolving that when I grew up, I was going to live in the woods and have a farm. And I would have twelve chickens. I would not eat the chickens. I would eat their eggs, and we would have. This is very specific. Yeah, it was very specific. I drew pictures of it and everything. It was like like my little vision board when I'm seven years old, you know. So uh, mm -hmm. anyway, that's where my desire to work out life on a farm began. Yeah. Where the where Spring Forest actually got started um, 20 years ago when I started my first academic job in Ohio, uh, in North Central Ohio, my husband and I bought 23 acre piece of property that had beautiful uh, soil where we were going to grow a CSA garden and, you know, farmer's market garden. And we were building retreat space because I was at that time doing quite a bit of spiritual direction with burnout pastors. And so we wanted sure. to create yep. this Those, retreat mm -hmm. space. And I have a lot, a, a strong background in spiritual formation. And so, um, so I'm, I was working at, at Ashland seminary and we were going to create this space. And then my job changed and needed to go to uh, Texas to, to Perkins school of theology so that was a big change that wasn't in our plan, but you know how God kind of sneaks up on you yep. sometimes and off you go. <laughs> so uh -huh. there, there we went. And, um, but as we were getting ready to leave, I, I heard this very distinctly in prayer. Don't give up on this dream. It's going to happen in the future on a better piece of property and at a better time. So don't give up mm. on it. So, so that comforted me a lot. Well, we went to Texas and lived in the city, you know, and uh, yeah. lived in the city. We lived in Garland. And I, I loved my job at Perkins School of Theology. I was the professor of evangelism, and I just had so much elbow room to do creative things in, inside and outside the classroom. 
So I started a nonprofit called Missional Wisdom Foundation because I started these experimental communities with some of my students who were wanting to learn, and these were Methodist students who were wanting to learn yeah. what we now call fresh expressions. Back then, it wasn't called anything, <laughs> just hippie. Words. Yeah, we, we actually, Emily and I, a couple of years, a few years back, did some work with Missional Wisdom okay. uh, mm-hmm. Foundation and, and got yes, to know that did. crew really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so the first... <clears throat> I had started the first two communities, and then a year later, I met Larry Duggins, who was my, had just come to the, to school there and became my student, and he joined in with me, and that's when we uh, created the nonprofit that was going to now be the umbrella for all these experiments. So, along the way with that, uh, that was that was great learning time. So when when our Epworth project was at its zenith. There were eight residential communities across the Metroplex oh, wow. and one in Waco. All of them were anchored either in a local UMC or in a Wesley Foundation ministry. They were all, all anchored in, a, in an institution. But they were all um, in the neighborhoods, very diverse neighborhoods, including undocumented worker neighborhoods, refugee neighborhoods, and there was even one that was rising young urban professional neighborhood, <laughs> uh, which is yeah, yeah. interesting. And so the students would live there. And so, so what happened as we developed that project um, and served oh, during the time that that project uh, shut down a few years ago, but by the time it finished, we had probably housed close to 400 people over the years, wow. mostly yeah, yeah, yeah. mostly students, but there were some other people too that wanted to be a part of this where they learned how to live in their neighborhood in this other way that we're referring to and following a rule of life and all the things so I learned a lot during that process about all sorts of mechanics of you know best practices and how things can go south pretty fast if you're not mindful and doing things the yeah. right way, especially with young people who are really yeah. idealistic and you know haven't begun to work on their shadow and all the things. So so learned a lot there. And and while we were doing that did what we could to incorporate sort of urban agriculture into some of the projects, into some of the houses, neighborhood gardens, community gardens. I started a a community garden on campus at SMU. And um, before long, there was an African student named Francis Kenua from Kenya, who I found out, well, he became part of everything we were doing with Mission of Wisdom. He lived and anchored one of the refugee neighborhood houses and all these things. But He was an experienced farmer from Kenya, as well as an experienced uh, superintendent minister of the Methodist Church of Kenya. So he became my my research assistant, and he ran that garden for me. And then for his master's thesis, he created a whole new faith community around the neighborhood garden. Oh, wow. And it it was utterly diverse. This group of people was more, you would not find a more diverse group of people. And here it is in Highland Park, you know, one of the highest net worth areas in the country, and all sorts of people at this garden. Wow. They, they still stay in touch with him and, and call him their pastor <laughs> all these years later. Jeez. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, That's so Francis is going to come back into the story here in a minute. So anyway, I would take my students uh, almost every semester down to DeSoto, and we would go to this um, experimental farm that was just a few years old where they, the people that ran it were former hellfire and brimstone evangelists that used to go on crusades around the world and, you know, show the Jesus film and tell people to get saved. And then they had an awakening and they realized what they really needed to be doing was creating sustainable agricultural systems for, with, with orphanages so that the, the, the villages yeah. could become self-sustaining financially instead of the toxic charity model and so on. So I would take my students to hear these folks' story and see how on a very small piece of land, they were growing an incredible amount of healthy food. And I, I just fell in love with that. And it connected back to my seven, eight-year-old dream of having right, yeah, yeah, chickens. Yeah. Your 12 yeah. chickens. Yeah. yeah. So you can see how these dots are connecting. Yeah. Plus, my mm-hmm. own location has been emerged from my healing from a lot of childhood trauma and young adult trauma. So creating a community where people can be safe and be fully welcome and uh, not be traumatized. This, this is all all coming out of my own journey. Yeah. So now, 
at its zenith, we had the eight community houses and two repurposed church projects with co-working spaces and social enterprise. And meanwhile, I'm learning so much from all sorts of people about these. I learned a lot from Larry Duggins about just the business side of things and how to do stuff that I didn't know how to do, you know, relative to, to business and legal things. So then I was recruited to come to Duke to serve as dean, which I wasn't expecting that at all. I was, uh, I'm, I always work on the edge of institutions and Dean's pretty much at the top of the. Yeah, you're put you, put you in the middle. <laughs> well, I don't know how this is going to go. But anyway, it, God made it clear, I, yes, I need to go out there. So as we were preparing to move from Texas, I felt deeply in my spirit that now is the time to look for that piece yeah. of property from years ago. So that's how we ended up buying the property that we bought here. And then uh, when we moved out here, some of our friends that lived in community with us in Texas moved here with us to continue living. In community. Okay. So, so what I'm trying to say here is the evolution of what has happened started long ago, and it's it's been an evolutionary yeah. process with iterations, and each way, uh, each point of the journey along the way has been rich and meaningful and necessary to yeah. build upon, to learn, to have these experiences and gain wisdom from failures and all that stuff. So now, the way we are here now, um, there's so many stories I could tell you, and there isn't enough time to tell any of them, but there have just been so many times where we, along the way, even since we have been here in North Carolina for the last eight and a half years, there'd be times where it felt like, oh no, this is a big threat. We're going to have to close things down for one reason or another, or we're going to have to whatever. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. um, by, by, by remaining deliberately flexible, kind of like, yeah. uh, like spiritual Aikido or something, you know, you kind of move with it. Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Something new would open up that was even better than what we imagined. And, and it's like we go through this threshold into these new iterations we just stepped across one of those thresholds over the last few weeks. And uh, each time it has resulted in something even more wonderful. So we are very much a work in progress, but it's been a long, long journey. <laughs> yeah, many yeah. Iterations. yeah. Well, it's, yeah, in each iteration, yeah. you, you know, you find something new, you do what makes sense for in that place exactly. in that time for those folks. Exactly. Um, that it, it, that it's, it starts both, you know, it starts both with a vision, but also a both, but also that flexibility, right? That it's not, right. we will only do this and we will do nothing that strays at all from this, but also there are bound. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that makes absolute sense. I, so in kind of reading and, and hearing about your reading about your background and hearing hear you talk about your background, you talk about the word evangelism, which, you know, is a is a word with some baggage in um, in in our modern world. Maybe not our fault, but it does. And so I would love to hear about your thoughts on um, on Spring Forest as as evangelism. Like, what does that mean for y'all in y'all's context of this idea of being a new paradigm for ministry, but specifically this idea of that this is evangelism? <clears throat> well, I really believe we're in a new era. We're in a new, yeah. we're in a new era that is just emerging. And it's it's filled with with grief and threat that have been caused by bad theology in no small part. Mm -hmm. yeah. Seriously, yeah. uh, anything yes. from uh, the climate crisis, which threatens to burn up the whole world, to uh, patriarchy, which is driving people away from religion of all kinds, yeah. um, and contributes to all the abuse and exploitation of women and children and vulnerable people in the earth itself. So we're, we're yeah. in this new era of, of reckoning and I really believe that evangelism now has to mean this. It has to mean smallish, smallish communities of people who love Jesus and are called to walk in the way of Jesus to heal the wounds that have been caused by Christianity, to heal the wounds yeah. of Christendom mm -hmm. that have been inflicted on the world for so many years. And so we have we have a very hard job ahead of us, and it requires 
constant repentance, which means constant, that word repent, you'll mean from seminary. Yeah. It means turning around and going in the other direction. You're, you're just going to go in a different direction, in, in a life-giving direction, because the way we've been walking is leading to death. Literally, there's yeah. death all around us. Yeah. has been. Yeah, literally. So, yes. So what this means for us is living in this way. And it means... Yeah, the evangelism word is, is just destroyed, isn't it? But we'll use it for sake of yeah. conversation. It means um, living the way we do for the sake of our neighbors, to be a blessing to our neighbors with no strings attached. Yeah. Being like people that. who love well, yes. being people who love the earth well, who love non-human living things well, according to what those things need in order to flourish, okay, so it means that. It also means living in such a way that it helps our neighbors to flourish. And paradoxically, when we live that way, that way of kenosis, the self-giving yeah. love, we actually yeah. find ourselves. That's where we find ourselves. We're lost unless we, unless we live that way. And it's impossible to live that way without having a community to live it together. It does take a village. Yeah, because yeah. we are either overwhelmed with shame and, and hateful thoughts and inner chatter about ourselves because of all the things we've been through, or we're filled with pompous self-importance and feel like we have a right to rule the universe. And, 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 and some weird combination of those things flipping back and forth, you know. So we yeah. have our... <laughs> the self-hatred thing. <laughs> self-hatred and you appoint yourself the ruler of the right, universe. Right. It's great. It's, <laughs> all, it's all in there, right? All those different parts. So... Um, we need a smallish community so we can actually be known and actually know each other and do life together. And, and when we do it for the sake of our neighbors, and this is very Bonhoeffer-ish, what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's magical. It's magical. This wonderful energy of love is released that heals wounds, that creates open spaces, that, um, uh, that's, that startles people. I, we've had so many yeah. startled people at Spring Forest. This is a church. I didn't. I didn't even. I don't even like to say the word church. You know this, but this feels good here. I feel welcome here. You mean I can go <laughs> yeah. to Spring Forest and I don't even have to believe in God? Yes, you can. You are very welcome. Here. Yes. yes, very welcome here. You mean I can be part of Spring Forest and still be Muslim? Yep. I can be queer. Yep, absolutely. You can be queer. You you can you can be in a wheelchair. You can <laughs> you can even be a straight yeah. white guy. It's okay. You know you can be. It's every, yeah. yeah. Thank God everything's fine. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's in space for us all. Because we're, we're going to practice I, our practices together, and they're they're practices that are healthy for everybody. So yeah. I I think one of the the themes that we in a lot of these conversations that we've had is what the is that I don't think I heard it phrases repentance, but it's absolutely what it is that, uh, for a while, for centuries, maybe, and certainly for a good part of this one and the last one, we've talked a great game and then we've lived the opposite way. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. and the world, the world figured out that we were hypocrites and then wanted nothing to do with us and rightly so. And so much of this, you know, th these, these emerging new things, these fresh expressions, these whatever words you want to put around them, go back to something uh, we we learned, you know, in a previous interview. It's just we asked a, a gen a, a, a Gen Z guy like, "Hey, what what is your generation looking for in the church?" Like one of these really like bod standard churchy questions. He was like, "What if y'all were good actually?" And I'm like, "Oh yeah, okay." And it turns out like, "What what if you were good actually?" Because it's really clear that you're not. I'm like, "Huh." Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I, I hear that resonance in, in this, this kind of theology of repentance of, yeah, what if we were good actually, or strove mm -hmm. at least, you know, we, we, as Wesleyan theologians all, uh, we, we, we strive, I mean, maybe we don't start out totally there, but there is that like, oh yeah, what if we were just good? And what if we were just like open-minded and uh, to steal something from tabletop role-playing, what if we just played to find out what happens? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, there's a, a phrase I heard from Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove uh, a few years ago, and William Barber, they were doing some things together. And he said, we believe in evangelism through fascination rather than force. <laughs> yeah. That, um, yeah. But what, what are we evangelizing people to? You know, 
because that has been so consumeristic. It's been conversionism. It's been yeah. the disguised exploitation and manipulation. Sure. I, I really believe what we're what we're called to evangelize people to is to be fully alive, to be fully alive. Irenaeus said the glory of God is a human fully alive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jesus shows us what fully alive looks like as a human being. We see that we, Jesus yeah. is our exemplar. We see that. So if we can get over ourselves and quit worrying about our membership numbers and all that ridiculous yeah. stuff. Yes. And actually be overwhelmed with what God is really like. <laughs> the God created this <laughs> incredible world. And then create spaces yeah. where every everyone else is easier for them to become fully alive. Yeah, that's that's what it's about. Yeah, Emily and I in our kind of pr- one of our previous iterations of ministry um, together as a team, and we're gonna you know kind of I think we're gonna do a show about this, but like one of the things we had to do was like clean up a church culture that had been so built on like a, a joy of bigness uh-huh. that what made this church amazing was the tale of the numbers that it told. Mm-hmm. And like, I, I don't know about you, Emily, but like that nearly destroyed me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Because it was never enough that, you know, folks were finding new life and we were building community and like cool, weird things were happening. It was, well, there are fewer bottoms in the seats. And because there are fewer bottoms in the seats and few, less money coming in, clearly this church is dying, failing. And, and like, I, you know, th- frankly, that nearly psychologically destroyed yeah. me. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, a lot of my church trauma, I, you know, I had lived, I guess I'd li- I had lived a blessed life that I, I didn't have a ton of it. And I have a lot of church trauma from living, trying to live out this culture of bigness Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it was, I, you know, I I found it absolutely destructive. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's the product of the syncretism between late market capitalism and Christianity. It's just a, an unholy alliance. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. We, we, uh, um, I won't name names because we live in a weird system, but I know of, um, a place within the United Methodist church where, uh, literally pastors were being judged by algorithm. So they would punch in a bunch of numbers of like uh, church attendance and giving and baptisms and whatever. And out that would come something of some expression of that pastor's value. And we are, you know, I think we are seeing in our economy, in our world, a breakdown of the kind of growth at all costs that, you know, it must grow. There must grow. Well, at some point you have sold every adult human a smartphone and the only thing you can do is sell them another one, right? Like there's no, there's no untapped market. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I, yeah, you're right. Like church really, you know, mainline and evangelical Christians alike really bought into that growth at all costs mindset. Mm -hmm. And it is, uh, you know, it certainly growth at all, growth at all costs has destroyed our planet and was, is also destroying our souls. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I finished reading Brian McLaren's recent book, um, life after doom. Have you read that? I have not yet. yet. Yeah. That, that, that's his best book so far. And, it's all about overshoot, all about consuming more than we can replenish, than the earth can replenish. And this mindset mm-hmm. in the church, it's done the same thing. Like the, the expectation that you have to get bigger and bigger and bigger, or you don't yeah. count, or we're going to punish you, or whatever. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's part of that whole uh, overshoot, the consuming of energy, the the acting like there are no consequences. Yeah. One of the things that I love about your mission and your vision at Spring Forest is that return to this organic growth of healing the planet and healing the person. Um, I want to live on a pharmacy. Our vision boards are very similar. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think that a lot of people who don't know that they are seeking the divine um, are returning to practices like uh, homesteading, like sourdough bread baking, mm-hmm. like, you know, t- the things that give life um, in their simplicity. And so I love that you have created this space for people to heal and to grow um, in these ways in these forms and functions where where they can heal and grow um as we were intended to in a garden right um with chickens 
<laughs> yeah, that's, that's wonderful. You're right. Um, things like knitting, all, all the homesteading skills. Yeah, young adults yes. are all moving in that direction, or many of them are moving in that direction. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, even if, I am, I am not, I'll, I'll be, uh, I'll admit it. I am not a plant person. I have killed every plant I have ever. I ever, am the plant uh, person. <laughs> my, my, my wife gave up on, she used to keep, every time I would get a new office, she would buy me a new office plant uh-huh. um, because she was like, Trey, you need, you know, and I have ADHD and they say that like, you know, closeness to nature and plants are good for that. And I'm like, okay, yeah, no, great. Every <laughs> one of them died. I kept a fern alive for six months once, but like I, when, when my wife and I moved in together, I killed the fern that she had had since sixth grade, right? Like I kill every plant that I touch. But so my version of that is, uh, was woodworking, right? Um, I, mm-hmm. I, during COVID was, uh, I think that a lot of us had this like real need for during COVID, but like I, I, I had grown up building theatrical sets and, um, I, so for me, it is it maybe not growing something, but it is building something out of natural, natural materials yeah. of like uh, that, that idea of uh, having that craft and letting that connect mm-hmm. me into the creative power of God. And it, like, that was my version of this because the plant was never, it just wasn't going to happen. <laughs> well, you don't have to own the plant to be blessed by the plant. You can walk through a forest and it's near the yes. air and it's good for your soul. Yes. I, I'm curious how the, the ministry with refugees, like how did that become a part of uh, y'all's work and life together? Well, when I started the first two experimental communities in Dallas, when I was at SMU, um, we, one of them was a missional house church and one of them was uh, a new monastic house with some women living in it, students. Okay, so about the fourth or fifth time we met for, uh, on a, I think we met on Sunday evenings um, for a meal and worship for the Missional House Church, which we call that New Day. We, that's what we call those New Day communities. One of my students who was from uh, the DRC brought six Congolese refugees that had just arrived, like that very day had just arrived from the refugee Jeez. camp, and he brought them, and they didn't speak any English at all, and of course, he could translate because he, he spoke languages. Yeah. So he brings them, and here we are, and that <laughs> was kind of hilarious because that night we decided we were going to have a very contemplative Taze kind of service. And for whatever reason, somebody that came occasionally brought a, a small bus full of children. <laughs> so all <laughs> so my careful plans for Taze with candles and icons, and it was going to be very soup and bread. And then you've got... Congolese men that don't speak English and they're terrified because they don't know what's happening. And then all these noisy children. <laughs> we were at the Wesley House. We were at the Wesley House on campus and it was just awful. <laughs> oh, you love those moments. Oh my. <laughs> this is, you know, humans make plans and God laughs. Yep. Uh-huh. We do. We all eat sandwiches and I was glad when it was time to go home. And then, um, so the student's name was Christian. So I said, I'd like to go visit those men. So he took me to visit the men, or I, I drove the car and he took me where they lived. And I went in their apartment and they had no furniture. They had no food. They had nothing. They wow. had they had one yeah. rickety folding chair and a rickety folding table. And they opened the refrigerator Jeez. to give me a bottle of water because the water is horrible there. And there was no food in the refrigerator, and they gave me their one bottle oh of gosh. water. It was really appalling. And um, yeah, so that was the beginning of befriending refugees. And over the next several years, we became very connected mm-hmm. with all the refugee services in in Dallas. There were three different agencies that we connected with, and we set up these community houses in the neighborhoods where refugees are resettled, and. Francis, when Francis came as a student, he agreed to anchor one of those apartments and live in it. And then that would be where this is in a different apartment complex from the the one before. And that he would anchor our New Day gatherings and our community meals. And he would reach out (coughs) and befriend people because he spoke Swahili, which was the language of many of the people. We also worked with um, uh, Spanish-speaking refugees and immigrants um, and some 
mm-hmm. other people. So that very much uh, influenced. I, it was a huge learning curve for me and for my students, frankly, you know, because most of them never had worked with refugees or met a refugee. But it really was life changing for all of us. And yeah. So that when we had the opportunity to buy this farm uh, next door to the property that we bought when we moved here. My husband said, we're going to have to get Francis to come out here and be the lead farmer because you and I are not farmers and you're working. And I'm like, yeah. Mm -hmm." So so we were able to work it out with Francis and the three bishops that were involved. And he and his family came out. I mean, it was quite a complex process. Yeah. And and as soon as he, he was out here and we were kind of working on the infrastructure improvements that were needed on the farm, um, we connected with, um, uh, Church World Service here in Dallas, which is one of the two refugee agencies in Durham, rather, and said, hey, we would love to befriend refugees that are arriving. We've done this kind of ministry for years in Dallas, and they were they were really happy about it. So that's how we got yeah. started right at the very outset, you know. Sure. Yeah. That it had come from the previous work and you had these relationships right. and you kind of had you had gotten over that like learning curve of what is this? Uh, we have, you know, I ha- in my own work, I have that learning curve mm-hmm. of, oh, I had done uh, like uh, multicultural ministry. I had worked in Latin America, uh-huh. but I had never done like, oh, everyone here but me is an immigrant. And so mm-hmm. I didn't, I, maybe I should have seen this coming. I had no idea how much furniture we would be tracking down oh on, on a weekly basis. Yeah. On a weekly basis, we are tracking down furniture. And I, honestly, we're also then going Raiders of the Lost Ark on the church. So we have this giant, <laughs> um, right, well, this is the show, know this, we have this giant, like, 1,200-seater facility home to a church of 160 souls. And so we are, you know, just plundering the depths of, oh, we have six cribs from the 80s out the door they go into uh and and you know Basoriani, my associate will come to me like hey Trey, can i have this and i'm like um is it is it bolted down if the answer to that question is no out the door it goes um, if it's yeah, yes it, we'll unbolt it and then you can take it, it honestly if you need it and i can unbolt it from the building uh we haven't figured out where the pipe organ's gonna go yet but someday it's um, a room of requirement so yeah, you know, harry potter the- you got over that learning curve. And so then you kind of, that's a competency you bring into ministry. And so then yeah. that allows you to take that next stage. Of yeah, it. that's right. Yeah. So I, I, we alluded to this at the beginning um, and you know, uh, we, we talked about in the pre-show and I'm the, I'm the, how do you pay for it guy? Like, cause that's a lot of my life is, you know, this, this, the kingdom of God is in breaking and uh, uh, but also the bills keep going out, you know, the money yeah, keeps right. going out the door. And so how, how do y'all fund this thing? Um, you, you kind of alluded and, you know, we've done some work with missional wisdom and are, are you know, familiar with, with that work, but you know, how, how does this pharmacy pay for its existence? So a uh, combination of things. First of all, um, my husband and I bought the farm next door when I was still working as Dean. And then when I left that job, some friends, brand new friends bought it from us so we could continue the ministry and they could join in. It was quite miraculous how that happened. Yeah. So there are two couples, my husband and me and this other couple who own the property, who own the homes and all the things, the material property. And then, um, so, so our church does not pay for property. The only, nice. the, okay. the, yeah. yep, the only property our church budget pays for is the porta potty for the farm. And it's, <laughs> nice. we rent that. It's like 90 bucks a month and it's handicap accessible too. <laughs> so nice. it's really nice. You can put a spare in there the with ones. the baby and go to the bathroom at the same time. It works. So, um, so there's that. And then, uh, and, and one of the things I learned from my time with missional wisdom is, uh, you don't have to be afraid. Just get the right insurance policy. <laughs> just yeah. get the right insurance yeah. policies. Uh-huh. You can do ministry very creatively. Just make sure you have the right insurance policy. That doesn't need to be an obstacle. And you, we do all our safe sanctuary training because we work with vulnerable people and all those things. Okay. So then, um, uh, Francis was here for three years and then got reappointed to the Great Plains Conference. So then we asked for me to be appointed because I was retired by then. I'm a retired elder and retired from academia. I'm retired from all the things institutionally. <clears throat> so we asked for me to be appointed 
because we did not need more elders to be appointed here. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we we did have a walk down. We still have a walk down church, new church start grant that was like for five years or something like that. You know how they get smaller every year and you. Uh -huh. OK, so it was one of those. That's that's really. We're on a year five of a three year deal. Very familiar. <laughs> so this was a and the grant was for staff. It was really to pay for staff. So when we, we learned that Francis was going to be going back to Great Plains Conference, we asked if we could continue that staff grant, but use it for farm workers, not for clergy. And the, oh, wow. the conference said yes, because we knew we would need some extra farm labor to be able to increase yeah. the size of the CSA, begin to develop a range mm -hmm. of agritourism offerings that we would offer that would generate revenue. So that was kind of where we were looking. That's awesome. And then also we anticipated that our our worshiping and following the practices together community would also grow a little bit and then would um, stewardship, financial stewardship would grow. Um, so, so that's all happened. That's all happened. And, um, and so I am bivocational. I have to get paid something because I'm appointed here and our polity requires. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, so the way we worked it out is I'm appointed quarter time. <laughs> As a retired <laughs> borrowed elder, my, my clergy membership is in the Western North Carolina Conference. So I'm a re retired borrowed elder at quarter time, and I get paid $5 a month. <laughs> so, oh, perfect. Yeah. 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 Okay. Because, yeah. Uh -huh. um, because I'm retired and my husband is retired, we're, we can, we can um, support ourselves with our income, and I can work that way. And then, so the only people who get paid for working at Spring Forest we have two super part-time administrative assistant type people. Okay. We did have one full-time and two very part-time farm workers, but they all went to different, the full-time person went to a different job recently and the other two decided to go in a new direction. So this is the threshold I was talking about. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So before that happened, <clears throat> I probably spent, eight hours a week working on the farm, primarily taking care of the goats. I shepherd goats and people. Goats are easier to shepherd than people. <laughs> I, I can believe that. <laughs> so about eight hours. So I made the decision and really prayed about it and talked to our core team and everything and my husband. So I decided that I would um, take up the role of lead farmer, which remember, I always wanted wow. to have those 12 chickens. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah, has yeah. Been here, for a while. here you go. I would be, I would step into the role of lead farmer. I continue to be the abbess of our community, and um, that would take any financial uh, burden off of the church because really the walk down grant was for staff, right? And right. Uh, mm -hmm. Meanwhile, with the loss of some of our farm workers, we had to make our um, our CSA smaller instead of larger, so it was like a bump in the road. But, but yeah. what this bump in the road has done really is open up space for me to step into a role that makes me feel like I finally come home to all the different parts of myself. Yeah, that it all came, that all of these callings across the course of a lifetime kind of all settle into yeah. that one place. And now that I'm working full time on the farm, 40 hours a week, I do try to be disciplined about my time. What it's giving to me, it's, it's, it's work that I truly love. I love the physical labor, but I, I love the solitude of it as well. Yeah. And that's something that yeah. I've been craving for several years, more solitude. And now I have that. Yeah. I'm still continuing to do some, some teaching gigs and you know speaking here and there, but, sure, sure. but I'll do much less of that in the future other than when people come here to learn at the pharmacy, which more and more people are coming here to learn what are you doing? What's this mean? Etc. cetera. So, um, so our financial model includes re regular, there, we do have members of our community who tithe um, or regularly give what they can. We do yeah. still have some grants and, I, and we're, we continue to write grants when it makes sense to kickstart a new project with refugees or with vulnerable women. And we've written grants for all sorts of things. Um, we do have income from the CSA. That's probably been half our income has come from 
Oh, wow. From selling the vegetables yeah, yeah. and eggs. And that's also how we meet people and form friends and do, do cool things together. Yep. And then um, uh, agritourism. So for us, uh, we do we host a lot of retreats here. And smart. Yeah, yeah. soon we'll have more space for people for overnight retreats. And so um, that's a revenue stream and a ministry that aligns with our rule of life. Yeah. And um, we've had events here. We did a Celtic festival in the spring. We've done oh, mothing nice. events and all kinds of things, naturalist events. So all of that falls under spiritually based agritourism, and that's that's a significant revenue stream as well. So the revenue yeah. streams are small businesses, but they also do ministry that's helpful to the world. Yeah. And it, so it's one of those, like all of the things align with your values and your mission, right? Exactly. So the CSA, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you sell food for money, right? This is, this is agriculture, but also it is making new friends and providing something healthy for the people in your community who you love and, you know, want to be a part of this thing. And right. You want to create space and healing among nature. And so folks even far beyond your community who are coming in for retreats can experience that. And so all those pieces connect together. Yeah. You are offering value to the people who are coming to you and they're offering some value to y'all as well. Right, right. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening. It's it's very integrative and holistic. Yeah. And I, I really believe, uh, and it's grounded in the ancient monastic way. You know, the Benedictines have always yeah. supported themselves with farming and making beer and baking bread yeah. and all the things. It's mm -hmm. great beer. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and great cheese. Yes, and I mean, mead. A lot of yep. the food... A lot of the food I like to eat comes from, you know, these, these monastic traditions. Right. So it's an it's an ancient practice. Um, yeah. So for me, as long as the small business does good for the world, good for uh, for living things, human and non-human living things, and it uh, opens up space to for ministry to flow through it, that's that's a blessing, and it generates revenue. Yeah. To me, go for it. So I, have, I, we, I could talk to you literally all day. Um, and uh, would, would, maybe I should, you know, I, I pass through North Carolina four times a year um, because my wife's family's um, in Virginia. And so maybe I should swing by the, the pharmacy yeah. someday. Um, mm -hmm. But so I, I asked this to a lot of our guests, and it's a really simple question. It is, um, you know, in 10 years, what do you hope the capital C church looks like? based on your experience and what you have strove for across a lifetime and a career, like in 10 years, what, what do you hope, you know, far enough in the future that like things that have not yet started yet have gotten going? Like, what do you hope the church, the capital C church looks like in 10 years? I, well, I, I can tell you what I hope and what I think those might not be the same thing. Sure. <laughs> Sure, absolutely. No, go, mm -hmm. please. I think that I think that because of polarization, it's it's going to get worse before it gets better. Right? Yeah. So we're yeah. going to see a continued rise of fundamentalism, with its sort of Handmaid's Tale, bizarre, super right wing nationalist energies that are so destructive and frightening yeah. and um, yeah, just terrible. Mm -hmm. We're going to see an increase of that. And then we're going to see an increase of really courageous people that are more um, grounded in the actual gospel and the gospel traditions yeah. that are prophetic and healing, um, creating very interesting um, communities, uh, spiritual communities that, that Meg Wheatley has called islands of sanity in a sea of chaos. Yeah. Local. I like that. I like that phrase. Yeah. Local neighborhood expressions of community um, where there's generativity and um, safe space and healing and, and good work happening. Um, that's going to happen. And then there will be a continued death of seminaries and schools of theology that can't adapt to these changes because sure. they're for various yeah. institutional reasons. There will be a continued death of church congregations. There will be continuation of uh, larger and mid-sized and even smaller churches that figure out how to be healthy, that figure out yeah. how to get over themselves and mm -hmm. become anchors to all this creative work the Spirit is doing in the neighborhood. So there will there will be those that are kind of uh, you know during the during the Reformation there was a Counter Reformation in the Catholic Church, right. Yeah, so there'll yeah. be sort of a counter-reformation going on within the inherited church too, and we'll begin to see expressions of that um, that are that will be hopeful. 
um, that's what I, that's what I foresee. And my hope, yeah. my hope is that there will be at least, well, I, I hope there will be a goodly number of people of all ages who, who, who see what's happening, who will give themselves to what it's going to take to create these islands of sanity. I pray that there will be islands yeah. of sanity all over everywhere because we're going to need them. We, we need them really a lot right now. <laughs> yeah. Amen. That's my prayer. Yeah. Thank you, Elaine, very much for your time, for your generous wisdom. Uh, we deeply appreciate it. Um, if, do you have anything you want to plug of like, you know, um, point our listeners towards any pluggables you've got? Sure. Yeah. Uh, if you go to my website, elaineheath.org, you can see information about stuff I do uh, in case you'd like me to come and do some consulting or something. Um, you can also see about my publications there and you can click on them if you'd like to order any of my books. If you go to Spring Forest's website, uh, springforest.org, um, you'll see lots of great information about what's happening here. And one of the things that you can access for yourselves if you're interested is um, on the fr front page, just scroll down and you'll see daily prayers and you can click on that. Members of our community have been writing morning prayer using the same pattern as Celtic prayers from Iona, just sort of the structure, but writing morning prayers coming from the Spring Forest community, coming out of our ethos Amazing. here and our theology. And, and it's being used all over the world now. And um, so our goal is <clears throat> to have all three years of the revised common lectionary readings that we're, so we, we're well into the first year now, about halfway through. And um, so we have morning prayer, we have morning and evening prayer on Zoom, and also people gather here who are around and we use those prayers. So it's a beautiful resource that might be helpful to yeah. you or your people. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, if you, you uh, listeners at home uh, have your own experiences of either uh, finding healing um, in community or your own hopes uh, for what uh, the church can be, please email us, thegoodnessofgodpod at gmail.com. That is thegoodnessofgodpod at gmail.com. Everything we do here in the Servants Now Media Lab is made possible by a generous innovators grant by the Texas Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. If you want to support us, like, comment, subscribe, leave five-star reviews on Apple Podcast. Share something you found meaningful. All of that helps this ministry go further and in that way become more sustainable. If you want more of what we do, it's at Servants Now on just about everything. TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and ServantsNow.org on the internet. And go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>